Uh, so the Bible reading uh, today is a reenactment of uh, Gospel of John, uh, chapter 4. Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard the report that he was making and baptising more followers than John. But really, Jesus himself did not baptise anyone. His followers baptised people for him. So he left Judea and went back to Galilee. On the way to Galilee, he had to go through the country of Samaria. In Samaria, Jesus came to the town called Sychar, which is near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his long trip, so he sat down beside the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to get some water. This happened while his followers were in town buying some food. Please give me a drink. Oh, I'm surprised that you asked me for a drink because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. You don't know what God can give you and you don't know who I am. I am the one who you ask for a drink. You don't know who I am. If you knew, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. Where will you get this water, this living water? The well is very deep and you have nothing to get water with. Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? He is the one who gave us this well. He drank from it himself and his sons and all his animals drank from it too. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But anyone who drinks the water I will give will never be thirsty again. The water I give people will be like a spring flowing up inside them. It will bring them eternal life. Sir, give me this water. Then I will never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come back to this well again to get water. Go get your husband and come back. But I have no husband. You're right to say you have no husband. That's because although you have had five husbands, the man you live with now is not your husband. That much was the truth. Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews, you say that Jerusalem is the place where people must worship. Believe me, woman. The time is coming when you will not have to be in Jerusalem or on this mountain to worship the Father. You Samaritans worship something you don't understand. We Jews understand what we worship since salvation comes from the Jews. But the time is coming when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. In fact, that time is now here. And these are the kind of people the Father wants to be his worshippers. God is spirit, so the people who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Well, I know that Messiah is coming. He is the one called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. He is talking to you now. I am the Messiah. Just then, Jesus' followers came back from town. They were surprised because they saw Jesus talking with a woman. But none of them asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to town. She told the people there, A man told me everything I ever did. Come and see him. Maybe he's the Messiah. So the people left the town and went to see Jesus. still okay <laughs> well as you heard that familiar story being read what did you see or hear what was coming through to you 
Jesus has come to the well. He's got an appointment with this woman. She doesn't know it. <laughs> Jesus knows her history. He knows her struggles in relationships. Five marriages. And the guy she's with now, she's not even married to. I wonder what's happened in all those relationships. Jesus knows and he's come to meet her. How does the conversation go? Starts off very simply, doesn't it? Please give me a drink. Immediately, she's objecting. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We don't interact. We don't talk with each other. You think I'm unclean because I'm not a Jew. How does Jesus respond? Well, he could have said, hey, hey wait on. I only asked for a drink. <laughs> Steady on there. But no, he knows what her needs and longings are. And he says in verse 10, you don't know what God can give you. And you don't know who I am, the one who asked you for a drink. If you knew, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. Jesus could have said, oh, you've been a really sinful woman. You need to repent. I'm the one who has the living water, real life. Listen to me. But no, he invites her gently. He says, God has something to give you. I have something to give you. He doesn't rush the conversation. He lets the woman speak on in verse 11, prattling on about the importance of this well. Yes, this is the well that our ancestor Jacob built. You can't be as important as him. He drank from here, from here and all his sons and animals and blah, 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 blah. Jesus listens and he comes back gently. If you drink this water, you too will get thirsty again. I have living water that will refresh you continuously. In fact, it'll be like a spring, never stopping, refreshing you and all those around you. Still nothing about her past. He hasn't mentioned her past. But again, more of the invitation to come to him. Verse 16, the woman says, okay, give me this water. She's thinking, great. I won't have to come to this well and lug this heavy pot around. Sounds terrific. And um, if, I, if I did have this living water, life will be so much easier. Thank you. And then Jesus hones in. He knows her needs and he knows her longings. Go get your husband and come back. I have no husband. And Jesus then reveals that he's known all along exactly this situation he tells her that what she longs to know that there is someone who knows her intimately who doesn't reject her who doesn't judge her but offers life real life it's a wonderful picture isn't it someone who will never leave her it's a great conversation isn't it this this conversation Jesus gently listening and offering invitations to come to him, to come to God. Today, what we're thinking about is listening. And I've called it the, uh, the, the talk, hey, can you hear what I'm really saying? <laughs> and I, I wonder how many times this week you were thinking, that person doesn't really understand what, what I'm saying or doesn't really know what I'm on about. This is the fourth in our series of We're Only Human. And we've said each week, that God made us for relationships with him, made us for relationships with each other, but also to relate to the world that he's created. So we're going to have a couple of role plays. I'm going to get George up here again. She's going to work hard today. And then we're going to think about some of the principles which might help us as we listen to others. We're going to look at a few verses from Proverbs, which have a lot of wisdom about how we listen and how we talk uh, to each other. And so we're going to be thinking about listening to others is really a sign of our love for others. Okay, George, first role play. Hi, Dave. I wanted to talk to you about your sermon yesterday. I was a bit concerned about something you said. Oh, yeah? 
Why? What was the problem? Well, you used it, that example of people who don't love others. I felt that it wasn't really appropriate because it could be quite offensive and upsetting to people. Hmm, really? Well, that's their problem. Yeah, that's your problem, yeah. Really, that's their problem. People have got to face their own issues. I don't want a pussyfoot around. Yeah, I guess so. I just thought I'd tell you. Okay, that didn't go too well, did it? Let's replay the conversation and let's see if there's another way it could, it could have gone. Hi, Dave. Um, just wanted to tell you, uh, to talk to you about your sermon yesterday. I was a bit concerned about something you said. All oh, right. What, what was it that concerned you? Well, you used that example of people who don't love others. I, I felt that it wasn't really appropriate because it actually could be offensive to some people. Oh, right. Gee, I, I hadn't thought of that. Um, can you tell me more about how it impacted or, or how it affected you? Well, yeah, I, I had a really bad experience 10 years ago when someone said that same thing to me. It really hurt me. And when you said all those negative, when you said it yesterday, all those negative feelings came back again. Mm, gee, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I certainly didn't mean it to have that kind of impact. What were some of those negative feelings that came? That, that must have been really hard for you. Yeah, I just remembered how how ashamed I was and, and I felt so criticised and, and worthless and I just felt like giving up. Thanks so much for your, for your courage in sharing that. That's hard, but thanks for coming and saying that to me about how this made you feel. I'll try and be more careful in, in future with my illustrations. Um, if you want to talk more about this, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Yeah, maybe so, another time. Okay. Thanks. And so there was a conversation which hopefully was life-giving. Listening, really listening. It's hard, isn't it? To really be listening well to others. But it's something that all of us do every day of our lives. So I wanted to, I wanted to raise it and talk about it today because it is so important. How can we listen well? What did you notice in the first conversation? I was defensive, wasn't I? Immediately sort of hmm, criticizing me. I didn't want to hear that I might have done something harmful or wrong or done the wrong thing. So I lashed back. Any possibility of some life-giving conversation between us stopped immediately. <laughs> Whereas in the second, the second time, there was the possibility of exploring those feelings of, of, of what I'd done and what I'd said, how, how it affected George. And in a sense, I was giving a safe, welcoming space for George to be able to, to share what she, was, what she was thinking and feeling. Just like Jesus with the woman, no condemnation, no judging, no telling her what to do, but an invitation. Here's a place that you're welcomed. Your deepest needs and longings are honoured, not mocked. You can be open and honest and find a place to share. So when someone says something hard to me or blows up in my face, I have a choice. I can respond and say, you've got no right to talk to me like that or, or, or something. Or I could say, hey, Dave, whew, those, are strong, those are strong words. What's going on? What, what's going on inside of you right now? What, what are you feeling? In the second way of uh, responding, there's no defensiveness, no judging. You're just interested in what's going on for that other person. What's happening for them inside? This other person who is loved by Jesus. You're inviting the other person to come into a safe place and share things which maybe have been pushed down and suppressed and which would be really helpful if they could share them. So, what, so why listen? I want to just think a little bit about why do we want to listen to people? First, listening affirms people. Indeed, listening is one of the highest forms of affirmation. When we listen, we're inviting the other person to exist. 
We're saying, you're, you're important. I do want to hear what you're saying. So the boss who pauses at the secretary's desk to ask their opinion, a mother who switches off the vacuum cleaner to listen to her child, a customer who stops to say, oh, how are you, to the salesperson. Each of these is saying, you're important. They're, you're acknowledging the other person's personhood. Jesus did this often. You remember that story in Mark 10 where Bartimaeus, the, the, um, the blind man, is there on the side of the road to Jericho. Big crowd with Jesus. He's calling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Everyone else is ignoring him. Jesus hears him and he goes over to him. Jesus stopped and he calls Bartimaeus to him and he listens to him. Second thing, so firstly, listening affirms people second thing is we strengthen each other through good listening one writer said for some strange reason human beings tolerate stress and pressure much more easily if at least one other person knows they are enduring it so if we're able to share this with someone else who really listens to us we're able to to uh, um, in, endure that particular thing life is a little bit easier if we can learn to ask perceptive questions and then wait for answers we can be that other person who is who is um, helping to share the burdens of the of, of someone else's life third thing listening helps the speaker clarify his or her thoughts as we give people an opportunity to talk we help them to sort through things that maybe then they're, they're not certain about and as they talk about it sometimes I know I've found it as I talk about it. Oh, yeah, I think I know what to do now. Proverbs 20 verse 5 says, The purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but a man of understanding draws them out. There's all sorts of things deep down here, but a person of understanding is able to gently draw them out. Jesus drew people out. For example, in, with that woman at the well, he wasn't in a rush with the dialogue. He didn't sort of say, oh, look, I've got to come to tell you about living water. Here it is. Take it or leave it. He was listening to the woman, seeing where she was at and not rushing in the dialogue there. He patiently drew her out. The same kind of unrushed talk time helps me when I'm trying to sort out an issue I'm struggling with. A good listener gives us the opportunity to express our views without being judged, interrupted, or redirected. We feel safe and unhurried. So we're more likely to express what's really going on deep down in us. And the fourth thing, the fourth point is that good listening improves the accuracy of our responses to what the other person's saying. In Proverbs 25, 11, 12, it says, apples of, like apples of gold in settings of silver, is a word spoken in right circumstances. Good listening encourages the speaker to continue talking. The first problem mentioned is rarely the real one. Often there's something deeper down, some feeling or some hurt or something that needs to be shared. Only as the speaker continues does the conversation head towards root issues, which is what we're, that second um, role play with George she was able to share more about the feelings deep down. Listening long enough will help us to hear the real statement or question and to uncover the feeling behind it. Unfortunately, I know I find this, I'm too, too preoccupied with myself to listen when I'm listening. Instead of concentrating on what the other person's saying, I'm often thinking, what am I going to say next? Or maybe even sort of thinking, oh, what they're saying is a lot of rubbish or... I wouldn't agree with that, which doesn't really help the, um, the listening. <laughs> you can always ask, why? Oh, I'm interested in why you think that, or, you know, and sort of again, try and find out what's happening for that person. In Proverbs 18, verse 13, we read, He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. So let's listen before we start talking. I cringe when I, some, I think about the times when I've poured out advice to other people only to discover that they weren't really asking a question that wanted that advice. <laughs> Such mistakes are costly because they leave the other person feeling misunderstood. And maybe, uh, maybe that person isn't really a safe person to share with. 
Good listening can help diffuse emotions that are part of the problem being discussed. Sometimes releasing those emotion, these emotions is all that, are, that is needed to solve the problem. The speaker may neither want nor expect us to say anything in response. I know I was talking to a person a couple of weeks ago that experienced a huge loss and were struggling with their emotions. We talked for almost two hours. Well, the other person did a lot of the talking, did most of the talking. I asked a few questions and said a couple of things. I probably spoke for about two minutes. I didn't offer any solutions, but I just listened. And it was really interesting because at the end, the person said, I feel much better having me able to talk th through this with you. I was thankful that I hadn't tried to fix the person or sort of come up with some solution. That wasn't what that person needed. They just needed to be heard and someone else to understand what they were going through. Just someone to listen, to give them a space to express how they were feeling to better understand what lay beneath the tears. Of course, there are times when expressing pent-up feelings is only part of the solution, and it's important that we go further than that. Okay, time for another role play. Thanks, George. This is a bit shorter, this one. Oh, Dave, just wanted to check. You made that booking at the Alroy for dinner, didn't you? What? No, I didn't. I assume didn't, you didn't want to go because you were complaining about how busy the week was. Why would you think that? You said last week that you were going to check if there was space for us, and so I just assumed you got a reservation. Ah. That was a short one. <laughs> didn't go very far. That one. <laughs> Hopefully it was a, we were able to say, oh, I'm sorry. Ever had a situation like that, a bit of miscommunication? And... Um, I'm sure it never happens to you guys. Um, but it's interesting how those miscommunications, misunderstandings often come from when we make assumptions about each other, as demonstrated in our conversation. We didn't do it intentionally. We're usually not itching for an argument with each other. In fact, most of the time, we probably don't even realize that we're making assumptions. That's what makes them so tricky, but not if you know what to watch out for. So just think of a couple of things which are helpful to think about uh, as we're talking to people. Um, I'm thinking, I guess, primarily about as I talk to George, but it can be any conversation between two people. When we make assumptions about the meaning behind some other, what someone else, other person has said, there's a chance you could be right. There's also a chance you could be wrong. <laughs> so it's really important to listen carefully and and to, and to not make assumptions. Um, sometimes what happens is it's our own insecurities and emotional triggers that um, cause us to take things personally and get defensive. I know that's what happens for me. We assign our own meaning to something they say, and essentially we're, we're putting words in their mouth. Then we respond to those words that we've put in their mouth instead of what they've actually said. And this leads to misunderstandings, leads to conflict. The key thing to work on is responding in a less reactive way. You might still have assumptions, but try and work out, try and before you come in with your assumptions, be mindful of what might be going on for that person, what um, emotions um, are going on there, and then respond with, with curiosity. I wonder what's going on for that person. I wonder if they meant this or maybe they meant something else and actually ask them instead of jumping to conclusions. This can go a long way to avoiding unnecessary fights or causing rifts between people. Okay, here's another little scenario. Um, it's, it's again, a husband and wife, but it could be for in any situation. Your spouse is late again. George is late again. And I'm thinking, well, it's actually probably Dave is late again. George is thinking, ah, oh, he's got a tendency to be late. And, and, you may, and I made sure to confirm with him when, they, when he needed to be home so that he could make it to the, my parents' anniversary party on time. George is looking at her watch. It's getting late. She's getting more and more annoyed with him. As She doesn't do this normally. This is just, yeah. um, it's annoying me, it gets annoyed. Um, she doesn't, she's getting more and more annoyed with him as, he, as she watches the minutes go by. She starts thinking how inconsiderate he is. Well, maybe 
Maybe he just doesn't want to spend time with my family. Maybe he's late on purpose for that very reason. She begins to get angry, not just annoyed. Just then, Dave bursts through the door. He's got the cake for the party. Dave stopped off at the shop to get the cake because he knew it would take more time if on our way to the parents' birthday party, we had to stop off at the shop. So he's actually going to save a lot of time. So it's sort of like, um, you know, George might have sort of feel, oh, gee, a bit sheepish, you know. Dave did actually, was actually thoughtful. He did it. But she made these assumptions of what the partners, in, of, what, of what Dave's intentions were. So this scenario is about a married couple, but you can think about others, other scenarios, probably with friends and things like that happen. It's so easy to, to lash out unfairly and, and then the other side gets defensive. We both get defensive and an argument starts and it doesn't lead anywhere. So how can we listen better? So here's, here's a few ways as we finish off this morning. A few ways to, to listen better. Firstly, listening is not a passive activity. Listening is not a passive activity. We want to try and actively enter into another person's situation and try to understand how they see a situation. And that's going to require concentration and careful listening. It means fighting distractions, not thinking about what am I going to say next, but forcing myself to ask, what is this person really saying to me? What what's lies behind those words? What does he or she mean? I don't want to be like the fool in Proverbs 18.2 who takes no pleasure in understanding but only in expressing his opinion. <laughs> so that's what the, the writer of Proverbs says about the fool. Second thing, so listening is not a passive activity. Second thing, I consciously withdraw so as to create space for the other person to open up and talk. I'm there for the other person. It's not about, well, I'm going to tell them everything that I know about this particular thing, but I'm there for the other person, listening carefully to them. You know, it's, I find myself, it's so easy to make comments like, oh, yeah, I know just how you feel. And then I blab on and tell them how, you know, my, my story and stuff. And then, you know, that, that could be helpful, but so often it, it may not be helpful because that's just going to distract from what that person really needs to hear from you. Um, I'm trying to learn to put myself aside and just listen and be listening what's, what lies behind those words. Third thing, I put more emphasis on affirmation than on answers. It's so easy for me. I, I find that in conversations with people, I want to sort of work out, I, I sort of see that there's a problem and I want to fix their situation. <laughs> and so I, I'm trying to think, oh, how can I, how can I fix this for them? Whereas the other person hasn't actually said to me, look, I want you to fix this for me. They just want someone to hear them. They don't want someone necessarily to do something for them. I'm learning that there are times where I need to give an answer or to help direct someone. But many times God just wants me to be a channel, to use me as a channel of his affirming love as I listen with compassion and understanding. As the other person finds security in my acceptance of them, then that person begins to believe that God loves them. As I affirm the other person, God is able to work with this person. And the results are much better than anything my feeble efforts to fix things could do. And the last one, listening is a skill to keep practicing. I'm aware that I listen well at times, um, but at other times, it's as, th it's as though I switch off. I want to improve. So I value you. I'm very open. Come and talk to me about things that I've said. If I haven't, if I've said things which, um, where I've failed to really hear you, or I've failed to listen well, we can help each other, I think, with this. We want to help each other to be good listeners. In my course this year, I've been doing uh, two chaplaincy courses. And one of the things that I found really helpful was I would actually review or go over some of my conversations with people during the week and think about what I said or didn't say and times when I failed to listen well. I relive the conversations and write down the questions I wish I'd asked and the responses I wish I'd given. 
And my supervisor in, in the course would discuss this with me. And he was very helpful in helping me to think about this. And this practice, I think, is helping me, um, hopefully, to improve my listening um, of other people. One last thing as we finish up this morning. I don't know if you realize, but in any conversation, there actually, there's you and the other person, but there's a third person there, isn't there? God's in that conversation as well. He's in there listening, participating. I just want to listen. In, in a conversation, I just want to listen to the other person. I don't want to fix them. I'm not the counselor or the therapist. Sometimes people just need to be heard. They need to know that they are so special that you are listening. You're not going to jump in and tell them all your life story. You're just going to hear them and you're going to be maybe asking a question which helps them to reveal something of, of, um, of what they're feeling deep down so that you can help, you can be a support for them, you can be an encourager for them. They need to know that they are so special that you are just listening. You're being the presence of God with that person. You're, you're like the presence of God with that person. The space you are offering is your time, and that's a generous thing. I'm not coming in to fix the other person. I'm here to just give them a space, just listen. And that's so powerful. I'm saying to this person, you're not a problem to be fixed. I'm offering something different. I'm offering myself. And God is there too. He is in every conversation that I'm involved with. What's God saying as he hears this conversation backwards and forwards? What is he doing in the other person? What is he doing in you through this conversation? What's he showing you about your own attitudes and beliefs? One of the things that I've been learning this year is that I come to a conversation to, to listen to someone with certain attitudes and beliefs. And God is sometimes, well, all the time, he's working on me as well. Because that conversation, that listening reveals what my attitudes and beliefs are. What's he saying to the other person? You know, God could speak out loudly and he, and he does at times, but most of the time he doesn't. He uses us, he speaks through us, he gently invites the other person through us. We are being Jesus, the presence of God with this person. What a privilege and an honour. I wonder how God might use you in your conversation at morning tea this morning. How is he going to use you in your conversations with others this week? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are gentle with us and you invite us into your goodness, into your life. Help us to listen to you above everything. Help us to listen well to others. Train us, Lord. Change us. Holy Spirit, help us to be your presence in the lives of others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.